we had lived up to the name of one of our founding parties. East, West, South and North, we are now the National Party of Scotland. It's a good phrase, you know, the community of the realm. It was a concept uh, <coughs> developed in medieval Scotland to describe an idea of community identity which was beyond sectional interest. The best Scots term for it would be the common wheel. It doesn't ignore the fact that sometimes as a government we have to take sides within Scotland uh, as well as taking Scotland's side. Particularly when times are tough we have to ask the, the rich to help the poor, the strong to help the weak, the powerful to help the powerless. But we always do so in pursuit of that common wheel, the community of the realm. We love Scotland, but we don't believe our, our country is perfect. We seek to, uh, to make it better. We know that in building the new Scotland, we, we must confront our demons from the past, like sectarianism, our problems from the present, like the abuse of alcohol. Now, some people say that tackling these things is unpopular. But the election told us that the people respect and understand that sometimes it takes guts to govern. But we shall always govern for that common weal. We govern, we have governed wisely, and we'll continue to do so. We have sheltered the community from the economic storms insofar it's in our power to do so. Our people, our community, face hugely difficult circumstances, a squeeze between falling incomes and rising prices. To help family budgets, we have frozen the council tax for four years, and we will continue to freeze it through this parliament. <clears throat> now, Labour say we shouldn't do this, really. And then we would have the same 60% rises as when they were in power, a council rise of £680 for a band D property. To help family budgets, we have held down water rates. The Liberals say we should privatise water. Really? And then we would be as powerless to act on water bills as they are right now to act on energy bills. <clears throat> and to help family budgets, we have abolished prescription charges. The Tories say we shouldn't do this. Tell that to the 600,000 Scots and incomes of 16,000 who were forced to pay for their medicine. Every household bill which is under our influence, we have tried to control. Every household bill under UK influence is out of control. In Scotland, we have a prices and incomes policy. In England, the Tories control incomes, except, of course, in the boardroom but not prices. None of these things, the freeze on the council tax, the ending of prescription charges, the stability in water bills has been easy. They are all difficult. But the record shows that the only government, the only party attempting to hold down household bills is the Scottish Government and the SNP. Now, the Unionist parties have lost touch with the people. Uh, Labour and Tories are parties without a leader. The Liberals have a leader without a party. <laughs> we govern well. They oppose badly. In the election, the people decided that Labour were not fit for government. Right now, they are not fit for opposition in Scotland. <laughs> Governing well makes a, a real difference to real people. Back in 2007, we said we'd put a thousand extra police in the streets and communities of Scotland. Labour said it couldn't be done, but it has been done. And the result has been a 35-year low in recorded crime in Scotland. I'll just repeat that. 
The Corgi crime in Scotland is at its lowest since 1976, when Jimmy Carter was elected President of the United States and Jimmy Savile was presenting Top of the Pops. <laughs> and I was tempted to work the first personal computers. <laughs> Earlier this week, a poll showed that people's fear of crime in Scotland was running at almost half the level of the rest of the United Kingdom, 28% against 48%. Much of that success is down to these extra police officers. We are the Scottish National Party. We believe in freedom. But the freedom of people from the fear of being mugged and robbed is a key objective of this government. And the thousand extra police in the communities of Scotland is a substantial part of achieving that objective. Let there be no mistake. Our reform of the police service of Scotland is about protecting the front line so the front line can protect the people. But right now, our focus is on jobs and the economy. John Swinney and his team, they spend every waking minute seeking to encourage our businesses to grow and to attract new companies to Scotland. We have the most competitive business tax regime across these islands. 80,000 small businesses either pay no business rates at all or have a substantial discount. We know, as they do, that their success is the key to future job creation. We shall continue to offer that crucial incentive throughout this Parliament. Let us be clear, the small business bonus stays in SNP Scotland. <laughs> but also, in the, in the last few months, a procession of major international companies have chosen Scotland as the place to conduct their business. From Amazon, Mitsubishi, Dusan, Gamesa, Viong, Avalok, the message has been the same. Scotland has the people and the resource to allow them to conduct their international operations from a Scottish base. And what have the UK government been focusing on while we focus on jobs and investment? They have formed a, a cabinet subcommittee to attack Scottish independence. Now let's get this right. Cameron, Clegg, Osborne, Alexander, they sit on a committee working out how to do down Scotland, engage in this, while the European monetary system teeters on the brink of collapse, while the jobless total in England is at a 20-year high, and inflation is more than double its target. And these politicians wonder why they carry no confidence among the people of England, never mind among the people of Scotland. Our message to this quad of ministers is clear. Stop attacking Scottish aspirations and start supporting economic recovery. We need more capital investment, not less. Finance for companies, price and job security for the people. And what is the grand strategy emerging from the Quad to restore their flagging political fortunes? To have more ministerial day trips to Scotland. Conference, every Tory minister who comes north puts another thousand votes towards the national cause. <laughs> of course, these visits to, to Scotland are, are selective. Very selective. Last week, the Prime Minister came to Scotland to hail the billions of investment in the new and oil and gas fields off the western approaches. However, there was no sign whatsoever of a ministerial visit this week when his government betrayed the future of Longanet. Over 13 billion from Scotland's oil and gas in the course of this year, but not even one tenth of that to secure the future of the clean coal industry of Scotland. Not even one-tenth of one year of oil and gas revenues to secure a world lead in a planet-saving technology. Mr. Cameron, how little you understand Scotland. When he was uh, 
making the BP announcement, Mr. Cameron claimed his geography teacher at Eton had told him all the oil would be gone by the turn of the century. The Prime Minister's memory is faulty. It wasn't his Etonian geography teacher. It was successive Labour and Tory governments, like Margaret Thatcher's energy minister, who claimed oil was declining in 1980. Now the cat is well and truly out of the bag. And we know that oil and gas will be extracted from the waters around Scotland for at least the next 40 years. Can I therefore put this very simple proposition? After 40 years of oil and gas, Westminster has coined in some £300,000 million from Scottish waters, around £60,000 a head for every man, woman and child in this country. The Tories' own Office of Budget Responsibility figures suggest another £230 billion of oil revenues over the next 30 years, and that was before the latest announcements. London has had its turn out of Scottish oil and gas. Let the next 40 years be for the people of Scotland. <laughs> now, Scotland, our country has the greatest array of energy resources in Europe. Oil, gas, hydro, wave, wind, tidal power, and clean coal. On Thursday, I went to Tinig to announce the redevelopment of that great fabrication site. Once again, thousands of jobs can be developed there as marine engineering comes alive in the highlands of Scotland. Today, I'm announcing a further important development in our journey to lead the world in wave and tidal power. A new £18 million fund to support marine energy commercialisation. This will support the development of the first commercial marine arrays, scaling up the devices currently on test in Scottish waters. And this is part of a £35 million investment over the next three years, which will support the testing technology, infrastructure and deployment. Today, Scotland is leading the race to develop offshore renewables. With this announcement, our nation moves up another gear. The message is clear. In marine energy, it's Scotland who rules the waves. Conference right now, some two thirds of wave and tidal projects in Europe are in Scottish waters. That will soon be three quarters. The announcement by Kawasaki Heavy Industries on Thursday of their intention to test in the Orkney Islands underlines the international impact that Scotland is having. And as we develop wave and tidal commercially in our waters, then we'll export that technology across the planet. Our objective in wave and tidal power is not just to have demonstration projects, but hundreds of megawatts of electricity by 2020, enough to power half a million homes in Scotland. The green reindustrialisation of the coastline of Scotland is central to our vision of the future. And the jobs impact will be felt from Macrahanis to the Clyde to Leith to Methil to Dundee to Aberdeen and the North East ports to the Murray Firth to Neg and the Highlands from Orkney Waters to Arnish in the Western Isles. All of these areas will benefit from the green reindustrialisation of Scotland. <laughs> now, onshore wind power has one serious drawback, and that is that only a little of the, the fabrication of technology is home-based. Despite the fact that the first modern wind turbine was demonstrated in Mary Kirk, Aberdeenshire in 1887, that's right, 1887, the technology of the onshore industry was exported to Denmark and Germany more than a generation ago. However, we can do something about our offshore renewable opportunity. Our objective is that Scotland will design, engineer, fabricate, install, maintain the great new machines which will dominate the energy provision of this century. That's our vision for Scotland, and we shall get there. <laughs> and in doing so, 
will create jobs and opportunity and hope for young people in Scotland. It is the inescapable responsibility of this government, indeed for every adult Scot, to help tackle the scourge of youth unemployment. Employment among Scottish youngsters is almost 5% higher than elsewhere in these islands. We have a near record of school leavers going on to positive destinations of a job, an apprenticeship or full-time education. However, this is not enough. Youth unemployment is still far, far too high. So this is what we are doing and this is what we shall do. First, apprenticeships. There will be 25,000 modern apprenticeships in Scotland, 60% more than when we took office, not just for this year, but every year. And in Scotland, remember, every single youngster on a modern apprenticeship is in a job. Secondly, every major contract or grant from government will now have an apprenticeship or training plan attached to it. For example, when Vion recently, in the last few weeks, chose Broxburn as a centre for excellence for food production, there were 50 modern apprenticeships in the new jobs. Thirdly, every single youngster who is not in a job of full-time education or an apprenticeship will be offered a training opportunity. That's every 16 to 19 year old under opportunities for all. Fourthly, we shall ensure that university and college education remains free to Scottish students. We now have more world-class universities per head than any other nation on the face of this planet. And thanks to this party, that opportunity will remain on, to young Scots on the basis of ability to learn, not the ability to pay. Today I am announcing a further move. Companies in the energy sector, even in this difficult economic climate, are reporting skill shortages. Therefore, over the next four years, we will deliver 2,000 modern apprenticeships specifically designed for the energy industries. However, we will also now provide an additional 1,000 flexible training places for energy and low carbon. Real opportunities for our youngsters in the sectors which will shape the industrial future of our country. Now we can't, we can't wipe every tear from every cheek, much as we would like to, but we can try. But everything that we do will reflect the common wheel of Scotland. The best way to get people back into work is through capital investment. That's why John Swinney is diverting funds to sustain economic recovery. That's why we created the Scottish Futures Trust to gain value for money. Major contracts sponsored by the Scottish Government are now delivered on time and on budget. And this gives me the opportunity to make a further announcement. Two years ago, we set out plans for a new school building programme in Scotland. Led by the Scottish Futures Trust, our investment was to deliver 55 new schools. 37 new schools are already committed in the first two phases. Conference, the Scottish Futures Trust has levelled the playing field in public sector construction contracts. We have sunk the PFI and replaced it with value for money programmes. <laughs> that's the sort of action that's allowed us to deliver over 300 new or refurbished schools in the last four years. And that's why today I'm able to tell you that the next phase of the new school building programme will be able to deliver 30 new schools across the nation, a dozen more than previously planned. That will provide a further 15,000 pupils with 21st century learning facilities. Delegates, in the face of Westminster cutbacks, the 2.5 billion non-profit distribution programme is crucial to economic recovery. None of that would have been possible if we had allowed the PFI rip-off to continue. That's what good government is all about. <laughs> now we face a, a winter in this energy-rich country of ours 
where people will be frightened to turn on their heating. Fuel poverty amid energy plenty. What a miserable, disgraceful legacy from Westminster to our energy-rich nation. <laughs> Fuel poverty amid energy plenty. If there was ever an argument for taking control of our own resources, then this must be it. The Prime Minister's fuel summit was little more than hot air. We don't control the energy markets, but we can and will do something to help. We already have the, the best heating initiatives in these islands. We've invested additional funds this year to make what's good even better. We've expanded our energy assistance package to include thousands of Scottish carers. And conference by 2050, the Scottish Government will increase our fuel poverty and energy budget by one third. And because of that investment, I'm able to make a further announcement. A few moments ago, you had Premier Rann of South Australia praising our offer of energy efficiency measures to half a million Scottish households. I can now tell you, by April of next year, that 500,000 will become 700,000, ensuring 200,000 more Scottish families. <laughs> 200,000 more Scottish families get the help they need to heat their homes in this energy-rich country of ours. On Thursday, I noticed uh, an outdoor company called Nay Limits. <laughs> Nay Limits to your ambition, your courage, your journey. Nay Limits sums up the spirit of freedom which many of us take from our magnificent landscape and which we wish for our society and for our politics. It's the same spirit that was reflected in the worlds of Charles Stuart Parnell. No man has the right to fix the boundary of a march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shall thou go and no further. No politician, and certainly no London politician, will determine the future of the Scottish nation. So the Prime Minister should hear this loud and clear. The people of Scotland, the southern people of Scotland, are now in the driving seat. Twenty years ago, when, when Scotland faced a, a previous Tory government, a cross-party group drew up a claim of right for Scotland. This is what it said. We do hereby acknowledge the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited to their needs, and do hereby declare and pledge that in all our actions and deliberations, their interests shall be paramount. Twenty years ago, we demonstrated for that right in front of a, an open-top bus in the meadows in Edinburgh. But we had no parliament then. The point is a very simple one. We have now that claim of right, and next month I will ask Scotland's parliament to endorse a new Scotland's claim of right. The days of Westminster politicians telling Scotland what to do or what to think are over. The Scottish people will set the agenda for the future. Kennedy once said, the future is not a gift, it's an achievement. That, that's true for Scotland as it is for, for any nation. Our future will be what we make it. The Scotland Bill isn't even enacted yet, yet it lies in the past, unloved, uninspiring, not even understood by its own proponents. <laughs> the UK government 
haven't even gone through the motions of considering the views of the Scottish Government, the current Scottish Parliamentary Committee, the last Scottish Parliamentary Committee. Total negativity to even the most reasonable proposal to strengthen the Bill's job-creating powers. The respect agenda lies dead in their throats. This is Westminster's agenda of disrespect, not disrespect to the SNP, but a fundamental disrespect for Scotland. The Tories and their Liberal frontmen have even taken to call themselves Scotland's other government. <laughs> a Tory Scottish government? I tell you, if Murdo Fraser thought such a notion was conceivable, he wouldn't be trying to disband the party. <laughs> In contrast, fiscal responsibility, financial freedom, real economic power is a legitimate proposal. It could allow us to control our own resources, introduce competitive business tax, and fair personal taxation. All good, all necessary, but not enough. Delegates, even with economic powers, Trident nuclear missiles would still be on the River Clyde. We could still be forced to spill blood in illegal wars like Iraq, and Scotland would still be excluded from the councils of Europe and the world. These things only independence can bring, which is why this party will campaign full square for independence in the coming referendum. the talent, the resources, the ingenuity. The only limitations are imagination and ambition. So give Scotland the tools, put the people of Scotland in charge and see our nation flourish as never before. Let's build a nation that reflects the values of our people, with a social contract and a social conscience at the very heart of our success. The society, the country that Scotland desires, that Scotland believes in, it is not a country or a future on offer from the Tory government in the South. Even that one single institution, that one institution which made, really made Britain great, the National Health Service, is being dismantled in England. The Tories call it a big society. I call it no society at all. Remember the founding principles. We are committed to winning independence for Scotland, and we are pledged to the tolerance of all Scottish interests. Both are in our DNA. It is who we are and what we are for. It is what makes us Scotland's national party. And that's more than just a name, it's a, an attitude. Over these past three days at, at this conference, I've seen that passion, that belief in action. We are a party with a mission because we know Scotland's cause is great and we know that Scotland's need is great. Let us be strong. Let us have our own debate about our own future on the timescale which was endorsed by our own people in May. And let's decide it in a proper fashion. Our task as a party is to convince the people of this nation that we can do better. To work at building a society which is not simply better than today's, but a beacon of justice and fairness to the world. And these things will come from hard work, from toil, and from sweat. Look around you. Look at where we stand now. Tell me this was easy. It was not easy. It was 80 years of hard work. We stand where we do today because of generations before us, because of party workers and campaigners who never saw this day. And we shall prevail because we share a vision, a vision of a, a land without boundaries, of a people unshackled from low ambition and poor chances, of a society unlimited in its efforts to be fair and free, of a Scotland unbound. No limits for Scotland.
Delegates, you know the bit about working harder than ever before? <laughs> well, there's a remainder of an agenda to finish today. So let's finish the agenda, work harder than ever before, and then win independence for our nation. Thank you very much. Delegates, delegates, I'll give you a few minutes to leave the auditorium or stay in for the remaining agenda items. Yeah. Ian Hutchinson's going to come and do the next bit. I've got a meeting with Charlie. Oh, is it? Right. So it's going to have to be. So given that by international acclaim, we have handled this mighty issue well as a government and as a parliament. What possible argument could there be that the Scottish Parliament is not capable of discharging all of the issues facing the Scottish people? <clears throat> I also wanted to, to say just a word about Scotland's late national poet, Eddie Morgan. He was a man whose modesty as an individual was matched only by his brilliance as a poet. He, he didn't wear his politics on his sleeve, but he's left this party a financial legacy which is transformational in its scope. And Angus Robertson will spell out that tomorrow. However, Eddie's real legacy, of course, to the world is in the, the body of his work. Eddie Morgan once told our Scottish Parliament... We give you our deepest, dearest wish to govern well. Don't say we have no mandate to be so bold. Delegates, by your applause, let's salute the life of our macker, Edwin Morgan. Uh, Nicola, a, a few years ago when I was cutting my political teeth in West Lothian and trying to work out what I did with that computer screen, <laughs> Billy Wolf, the late Billy Wolf, uh, once told me that the Scottish National Party stood for two things, independence for Scotland and home rule for Bowness. <laughs> in reality, of course, the, uh, the SNP does stand for two fundamental aims, and these are enshrined in a party's constitution, independence for Scotland, and also the tolerance of all Scottish interests. These are our guiding lights, and they are equally important, because they reflect the reality that our politics are not just constitutional, but people-based. I tried to reflect some of this on election night, when these self-same people, the community of the realm of Scotland, presented to us the greatest ever mandate of the devolution era, an absolute majority in a proportional system, a system specifically designed to prevent such a thing from happening. Mind you, it was designed by the Labour Party, so we should... <laughs> <clears throat> so, so perhaps we shouldn't be... Come on.